Among the trillions of stars in billions of galaxies, in a search for over a hundred years, we have never found in the entire visible universe any evidence for life beyond Earth. So many in the tech sector think maybe it would be a good idea to create a backup on another planet, you know, just in case. But before we go building self-sufficient cities out there in a radioactive vacuum, wouldn't it make sense to first see if we can do it here on Earth? The current state of our skills in this area and how to go about improving those skills are the topic of today's episode. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. We live in a violent universe where gamma ray bursters, asteroids, and perhaps unknown unknowns threaten us at any moment. And here on Earth, we face disasters of our own making in the form of nuclear war, AI and robots run amok, and even mundane threats such as plastics, which can degrade into tiny particles lasting for thousands of years and getting into all living flesh on the planet and gradually poisoning it over time. We face pandemics, of course, and ecological degradation that can be so intense and so existential that members of the tech and space community can't help but look for ways to escape them off of Earth. Stephen Hawking for many years said we had about a thousand year window before the cumulative probabilities of each of these disasters would be great enough that we faced a serious threat. In his final year, he shrunk that estimate down to less than a century. And the narrowness of that window was a big part of what motivated Elon Musk to dream up, fund, recruit, and build his SpaceX space launch company from scratch. Let's hear what he has to say about the subject. You know, there's, there's, there's a fundamental juncture in, in the uh, history of really any civilization on a single planet. The window of this op opportunity is opened now for the first time in the four and a half billion year history of Earth. It may, it may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time. And I think we should, you know, be hasty uh, so that just in case it's only open for a short time. Now, Musk's main inspiration for trying to build cities on Mars was a series of books by a guy named Robert Zubrin, who opened one of his books with the comment that humans are not native to the Earth, we're native to a small part of Africa and colonized the rest of the Earth. And so his assertion is that this is just what we do and space is just another step along the same path. But I think in tech circles, we often drastically underestimate the ecology involved in getting any system of life working. And we do so, as you'll see in a moment, at our peril. By the way, I've linked all of my sources in the description, and eventually it'll appear in the pinned comment. And while you're looking for those, go ahead and leave a like. And if you see that subscribe button, go ahead and gently tap that so that if we get disconnected, we can reconnect in the future. But here's the problem with that colonizing argument. When people began to expand our range, both within and beyond Africa, we didn't have to carry food and water with us. In fact, we didn't even have to carry radiation shielding or the three tons of air that we breathe every year with us. That was all provided for free even on our most arduous treks by the millions of other species that over billions of years had made the totality of Earth habitable. Space is not like that. The nearest land that we can reach in space on the moon takes many orders of magnitude more energy to reach than just simply crossing a land bridge. Tech people look at the moon and think, well, we'll figure out how to use the native resources. We'll figure out how to extract oxygen from the water at the lunar poles, and we'll make radiation shielding out of the regolith, the lunar soil, and we'll figure out how to grow food in it. How hard can that be? That is a literal quote from scientists that I actually respect. But in fact, what we forget is that what makes farming easy for us is a vast living world that has created not only the soils, but the entire environment in which we and our food systems live. Everywhere we've gone on the earth, We've co-evolved with local plants and animals that have been gradually shaped over many millennia by the selection pressure of our appetites. We have never put to the test the problem of assembling a self-sustaining ecology for any significant length of time. How would that work? Let me give you just one insight into what creates an ecologically rich environment. Of course, this is familiar to viewers of the channel, and that is the ecological wealth is measured by the number of layers of life that you can put between Earth and sky, because this number will determine how many times each resource, whether it be sunlight or rain or nutrients, is used and reused before it leaves the system. And that will determine how alive and vibrant the system can ultimately be. 
So the real question is, how good are we as a species at this moment in time at building such assemblages? Sadly, when I look around at the world right now, where large-scale agriculture accounts for 50% of the earth, it doesn't look so good. Due to the labor-saving mechanization that we've imposed on the landscape, at most we have a little less than one living being between earth and sky in all of our food systems. And this is the process that has wiped out half the living biomass on the planet. We've taken what was once a very efficient system of life and taken most of the life out of it. This is really bad news for the whole idea of building lifeboats for Earth, because the very weaknesses that have made this world half as much of a living world as it once was can only be magnified in a harsher environment. We need to address these fundamental weaknesses where it is both easiest and cheapest, as well as where we have the most resources for addressing them. How do we go about doing that? The Edenicity Plan is a combination of permaculture and urbanism. Permaculture is a design system of applied ecology that has about a million certified practitioners worldwide. It's focused mostly on home and homestead environments, but it's been rolled out occasionally on the scale of large farms and even urban farms. Permaculture is the premier system for reestablishing layered food systems with which we co-evolved. Unfortunately, permaculture's founders and most of its practitioners view cities as an intractable problem rather than a solution. Which is a pity because cities occupy just 3% of the land and house more than half the world. So if we can learn to rebuild cities in such a way that they can produce all of their own food and energy, then we could go on to restore the remaining portion of the earth and the lost half of life. In my view, permaculture alone is not up to the task and it's been avoiding the other half of the work at hand, which is the large-scale systems that cities have to meet our basic energy, transportation, and sanitation needs. These are systems that are best built at large scale with a great degree of specialization. So if you've been a permaculturist and you've built a layered food forest on your property, even if that property is in the city, that's not the same as the permaculture urbanism that would connect all of these larger systems in such a way that they work synergistically together meaning that the end result is of much greater value than the sum of its parts. Now, because this is a system that verges on utopian, there's been a lot of concern that it might be forced on people at some point. But I don't think that that's a realistic fear because the fundamentals of Edenicity are competitive in a world where people have choices, such as where to live. In over 100 videos on this channel, I've shown how Edenicity provides a much more convenient, more walkable and affordable way of living with far lower construction and utility costs. And by dint of being car free, provides transportation that's 50 times safer, four times quieter and 90% less costly than the status quo. And those are just the direct costs. It would also in all likelihood cut our healthcare costs in half or more. These are really compelling numbers to the extent that planners, politicians, and developers can be brave and move in this direction. They will find that these are already very compelling things to offer in a competitive housing market. I mean, I've been there. I've moved a number of times in my life. And in recent years, I've looked at the walk score, as I think many viewers of this channel have, of the different neighborhoods that they're considering moving to. Along the same lines, I've created an Edenicity map that you can visit through the Edenicity.com website. You just click on the map link and you can look up the Edenicity score of different cities throughout the world. Now we're just getting started. So the way this works is you compute your Edenicity score by answering a few questions. And then if you want to put your city on the map, what you do is go and join the free Patreon membership. So little by little, cities are going to start accumulating self-reported Edenicity scores. You just go to the Edenicity site, you click on map, that takes you to the Edenicity world map, and there you have it. But of course, that's not all you can do to start moving us in the direction of Edenicity. Wherever you are, you can oppose the activities that are wiping out large areas of the planet. Things like road widening, parking lots, strip malls, detached housing projects, which have environmental impacts far beyond their physical footprints. And you can support public transit, multifamily mixed-use development, and urban agriculture. And these are just the basics. What we're going to find is that places that move in the directions that I've indicated will stand out as far better places to live, and those are going to be the centers of economic activity moving forward. Now, even though he was down on space exploration and cities, 
Permaculture's co-founder, Bill Mollison, toward the end of his Permaculture Designer's Manual, wrote that he could, in his children's children's lifetime, maybe start to foresee a world where there are no eroded soils, stripped forests, famine, or poverty. But he did see a way in which we can spend our lives towards earth repair. He writes, if and when the whole world is secure, we have won the right to explore space and the oceans. Until we have demonstrated that we can establish a productive and secure earth society, we do not belong anywhere else, nor, I suspect, would we be welcome elsewhere. Now look, I got my start in space exploration. I love space. And to me, there's just something thrilling about continuing this story of life. If you've ever walked on a black sand beach that was just a few years earlier, bare ocean, and seen life swoop in to that volcanic ash and begin to seed it and gradually turn it green, you know how thrilling it is to think that maybe we could start to do that on a cosmic scale. And it's also clear that in time, the odds won't always be in our favor, so that we really do need to get good at this skill. But as I've shown here, the place to start is here on planet Earth, in whatever city people are living in today. And if we do those things, who knows what the future may hold. Thanks as always to the wonderful patrons for financially supporting this channel. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Edenicity, have a look at these videos here. Take care, stay green, see you next time.